Thank you so much for coming. It's nice to see the recognition of how important the subject is. Um, so, obviously, it's quite a few of you doing the big data unit, and we've said data is talked about as the new oil, um, and as the huge oil companies have extracted oil from the earth to drive our energy and transport and make huge profits. Now tech companies are extracting data from all of us to drive development of systems and tools. Um, and obviously security, there are huge implications for all of us, but particularly as educators, teachers, learning technologists, instructional designers, and these are really important issues. So we're really very lucky to have Dr. Daniel Bresner here to talk to us about this today. Um, Danny's accolades are so numerous, I can't possibly remember them, so I've written someone from day on to remind me. So he's, I think the important thing to say is his research is not just an academic exercise, it has a huge impact in practice and policy. Um, so his research here at the University of Manchester is academic coordinator for cybersecurity. Um, it's looking, um, he's found um, a method for detecting human vulnerabilities in networks. Um, he's director of research at e for the eRadar community um, for effective online business. He is the is IFSEC, IFSEC, um, highest ranking UK academic for global influencers in cybersecurity. It's a rubbish certificate. I mean, it really, really, really needs some design work. Um, and he also runs a security operations centre, which is, I think it's important to say, staffed by um, a neurodiverse um, staff protecting the vulnerable in society, and current research is including projects around balancing technical security controls with human factors. Um, so it's, it's about using information security maturity to model security economics, security metrics, IT strategy, and the dark net. Um, so conversations with Danny are always really inspiring, so um, very happy to welcome Danny to speak to you today. Never. <laughs> Thank you. Well, never knowingly under under soul there. Oh my goodness, I'm, I'm, I'm now terrified because I'm, I'm going to I'm going to try and live up to that. Okay, so I've got some certificates. Uh, I'm quite interested in cybersecurity. Um, I hope that I'm assuming that you must have a little smidgen of interest because you're here today, or maybe you just want to find out what it's all about. Uh, I'm just going to scratch the surface a little bit. Um, I'm hopefully not going to talk about too many cliches. Um, but hopefully this will be something that you will be interested in. I'll happy to answer questions as time allows at the end. Uh, please do get in contact with me afterwards uh, if you have anything you would like to discuss or ask. Uh, if you can't track me down after this lecture, then you're probably not that interested in cybersecurity. So we'll, we'll wait and see how it goes. But there's an awful lot going out and going on out there in what we might call the big wide world. We tend to think about stuff going online, but I think there's very, very little difference between kind of people's digital lives and their so-called real lives these days, uh, which is why I've distributed some little colored cards with you. So we'll talk about those very soon. But um, just to kind of run through kind of the kind of stuff that I get involved with. Um, firstly, you've got to put things into context. Why does Daniel appear so much on BBC TV? Yeah, because the University of Manchester is just down the road from the BBC studios, and I'm free. Okay, so you've got to put this stuff into context. So, for example, when there is a nice local story where a Salford couple is putting software illegally onto people's computers to drain off their banking details, they call me in to have a bit of a chat. Huge amounts of really clever technical stuff would not get through without a little bit of social engineering and expecting the victims to click on something either on their computer or on their phone. So, Phishing itself is not really an attack, that's phishing with a PH. Anybody know why phishing is spelt PH? Nothing to do with acidity. <laughs> PH, anybody? Yeah, guess, come on, have a go. 
Yeah, I got you a lecture on Monday morning, you see. Now, the Monday morning people I could expect. Okay, Monday morning, right? This is Wednesday lunchtime. Okay, you should have woken up by now. Yeah? pH. It's about phones. Hmm? Uh, yeah, the acid test of, of your attention. It comes with phones, the pH of phones. None of this stuff is really new. This has been going on for years. And hacking, doing clever things, maybe some of the things which people shouldn't be doing, has been going on for years. So one of the classic things, of course, was people doing stuff and playing around with telephones so they could get free telephone calls. Uh, Crackerjack. Does Crackerjack mean anything to you? Anyone? Yeah? I bet it's the wrong one. I bet it's the wrong one. Which one? The game show. The game show. It's not the game show, no. It's an American popcorn snack. And they were famous, or makes, and probably still are famous, for giving away free gifts. And I think it was in Cracker Jack, or a similar snack of that sort, where they gave away these free whistles. And people realised that with the old telephone system, you could blow these whistles down, and if you got the right number of tones, it reproduced the engineer's calls, and you could get free telephone calls. So a lot of these things have been going on for years in different formats. It's just that now we don't have to go to a phone box and start blowing a whistle down it. We can do loads of stuff just from our own homes. Ashley Madison. Who's got an Ashley Madison account? <laughs> Nobody ever tells me. That's a shame. I always think as well, perhaps maybe that day a uh, pink paisley cravat was not the, uh, the right fashion choice. Ashley Madison was the website that invites you to mix and match uh, and find a partner. But the catch being is that you're both married. Yeah, you're going to have an affair, find an affair online. I'm so, everybody's looking so blank. I am so pleased. Innocence, wonderful, wonderful. Um, anybody got a Talk Talk account? Their phones? I wonder if that's is that a deliberate um, a decision because of the number of uh, times that they actually had infiltrations and people's data, quite a lot of data, was stolen, and as a result of which people weren't actually getting their phones directly taken over, but they were using that data to social engineer people into thinking that they were from talk talk giving out more information and therefore perhaps maybe being able to uh, enable some sort of banking transaction. So little data can sometimes go a, go a long way. Um, anybody from Russia? No, no Russians here? Uh, you know, Russians, all kinds of accusations going on. And of course, when you listen to the BBC and the interviews um, about which country's hacking whom, you've got to remember that actually, of course, the UK and America and New Zealand and Canada, uh, did I get all the five eyes in there? Uh, you know, obviously, everybody else is going to be doing it to everybody. So, it, But it's an interesting area because to kind of where the morals and ethics start, because of course, I think it's fine for GCHQ to do stuff. Uh, not quite sure whether I agree about the GRU doing stuff, but there you go. Um, Gibraltar, anyone from Gibraltar? Gibraltar, no, no, no. Gibraltar, little, little um, spit of land at the end of Spain in an incredibly vulnerable place. It's between Europe and it's between Africa. Did quite a lot of work there a couple of years ago. Very interesting place because um, for all the tax reasons, they realise that actually it's quite good for lots of different companies particularly gambling companies who handle, of course, an awful lot of money to have their computers based there. They, the firms might be based there, their computers might be based there, the rest of the business might go on all over the world, but it's a very key place. So they've got this, the, the, the challenges of the mixture of physical security and cyber security to be dealt with all, all at the same time. Uh, really, ni really nice place to visit. Uh, quite exciting, actually, because you're still in Europe and you look out of your bedroom window and you, you actually see Africa out of the bedroom window. I, I was a bit disappointed. It was much smaller than I was expecting. <laughs> but, uh, but there you go. Um, and there is a new trend. A new trend. Generally, most of the stuff that will flash up on screens, historical case studies, have been people stealing large amounts of data. But um, last year, I think a new trend really started to emerge where rather than steal the pot and then everybody just getting online, okay, I'll change my password or change my credit cards, there's a much more immediate and live threat because what criminals are now doing is getting the software onto people's servers so that while you are typing in your details, 
They're list, essentially listening in and siphoning them off live, as, as several thousand British Airways customers uh, are actually found. So there's all kinds of clever, and you've got to, well, I suppose, admire some of the innovative ways. Uh, anybody use Uber? Yeah, oh God. life, hooray, hooray, let's all, let's all join hands and contact the living. Uh, I think one of the cases that you know, you've got to smile at, there was a, a lady in Northern Ireland, I think it was Northern Ireland, I can't think it was Northern Ireland, I can't remember which part of Ireland it was, um, who was arrested because she was caught running an Uber service for criminals, for burglars. So you break into a house and you find you've got too much to carry home, what do you do? You call one of these criminal Ubers <laughs> to come and take things away. Now, so thinking about know, Ubers, stealing data, credit cards, um, getting into people's systems. Are these crimes all up for debate? Certainly they cause a lot of stress. Can anybody spot the trend in those particular examples? One thing that you can see throughout those, one thing which is increasing. Anybody want to hazard a guess? No? Come on, just stab, get a stab at it. <laughs> The answer says more about me than it does about cyber security. Shall I give you the answer? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, yeah, yeah. Thanks. I'm, I'm, yeah. Mandy's actually giving you the CV there, so I'm not going to stick read out. You can find out plenty about me online. But I did think you'd, you'd quite like to see a picture of a, a towering intellect. And of course, the statue of uh, Alan Turing is always nice to see as well, so that's good. So, what are we going to cover today? We're going to cover today. Hopefully, I will make up for the promises or fulfil the promises that I've made you. So, we're going to talk about films. That's movies. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Films are great. Yeah, yeah. Who likes films? Yeah. Who thinks it's a real pain that you you know you have to wait till the DVDs come out or it comes on Netflix? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Who's, dis who's discovered streaming and uh, bit torrenting? Yeah? Yeah? Anybody done that? Did, yeah, seen a bit of a legal download? Yeah? Good job the camera's pointing that way, actually. I'll be honest, I've never done it, but I've just socially engineered you by kidding you to think, I've done it. Oh, it's okay. We'll talk to Daniel. We'll tell him all our, we'll tell him about all our sins. So trust is a big issue here that we have to actually think about. Because actually, as you will hopefully see and perhaps feel a little bit guilty of, and this is not necessarily about what you've been doing, but think about it next time you might uh, want to do it, that perhaps where we have got to today is your fault. It's because of what you wanted and the, how the markets have actually reacted to you. So we'll go through some of these things. I'm not just going to shout doom, gloom, fear, uncertainty and doubt, I will also give you some hints and tips that you can take away with you. So I think that's only going to be fair. And because we can't uh, actually cover everything, I will ask you to bow your heads in prayer at the end, and hopefully that will come out. But I'm not going to talk about numbers, because numbers are huge. And to be quite honest, when it comes down to it, it doesn't matter how many millions of records have been stolen. It's down to each individual tragedy. <coughs> And each individual tragedy, as somebody has had that data stolen, their bank account compromised, their email taken offline, uh, their reputation sullied because their email or their Facebook was taken over and messages went to their friends and the like. So that those individual feelings, I think, are far more important than trying to think about all these, all these great numbers. And I find it actually very difficult. I try to keep this montage up. This is not just about data, as I'll say in a, in a minute. Um, now, you see there one of the photographs, there's a great big um, fiery blast furnace where essentially the controls, which were open online, were taken over and somebody tipped out the blast furnace contents onto the floor of a factory. How do you clear that up? Anybody want to know what you do if somebody pours all your molten iron all over your factory floor? What's the tactic? What's the process? What's the, clear what's the clearing up process? Anybody want to take a guess? How do you clear things up? So, I'm, okay, students clearing up, probably not used in the same sentence very often. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you know, pile of pizza boxes. You can take those out quite easily. This, you have to move your factory. Mm -hmm. right? You just forget about it. This stuff goes down so deep into the ground, you can't start, it's not worth trying to dig it up. 
you move the factory. So we're talking big damage. We're talking about individual threat. Pacemakers. Insulin machines. Now this isn't science fiction. This stuff can actually happen. This stuff is happening. Dick Cheney, the, um, one of the secretaries of state in, the U in, the uh, in America, actually had the remote configuration facilities on his pacemaker taken up, taken up, taken away while he was, sec while he was secretary of state. Yeah, the people have to be quite close and there's all kinds of things, but these are real things that can actually happen. Car phone warehouse, car phone warehouse has been hit, I don't know how many times. So I just thought, well, we ought to have some stats for you. So I went online and typed in, I think the string was, um, car phone warehouse data hacks. And this was the response that I got. I don't actually think that's what they were trying to advertise at the time. But there we go. So like I say, never mind the numbers. It's more than just data protection. You now we're talking about being able to alter you know, the political certainties in our voting systems. You know, countries stealing intellectual property one from the other. The Office for Data and uh, Personnel Management in the States uh, was hacked and they got a load of data stolen. Some of that data included who was cleared to what sort of level across government in the States. So that was incredibly valuable intelligence to work out that if you were going to do something naughty, uh, kind of where the areas of strength and weaknesses might be. Anybody heard of Porton Down? Okie doke. Right, okay, just, uh, let's just take your name. Now, uh, it's fairly funny, you can find out loads about it. Porton Down is a, um, a weapons, a, a biological and, um, new, and chemical weapons research establishment. And it used to be uh, because they now reckon there's only so much you can control data and you have to control and protect things through other measures. It used to be that the number of toilet rolls being delivered to the laboratories was a state secret. Yeah? Anybody guess? Want to guess from what I was saying about uh, that American hack why the number of toilet rolls was a state secret? Yeah, yeah, because you can start to extract how many people are going to be employed, work out approximately how many would be in admin and how many would be in science, and as a result of which extrapolate um, what was uh, involved in the UK's uh, research program for biological and, and chemical weapons. So information has great value, but it also gives people the opportunities to do stuff Directly, uh, 250,000 thereabouts properties in the Ukraine Christmas a few years ago lost their power. Anybody from the Ukraine? Anybody know anything about the Ukraine? Anybody know what the weather is like in the Ukraine around Christmas time? It is not a time to start losing power. But so many parts, so many organizations, anybody from China? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, you knew it was going to come up, honestly, <laughs> didn't you? I'm just saying, it might just be coincidence, but if you look at the design, right, the US had this fighter jet quite well established, and they were quite suspicious that somebody had been on their systems. The forensics tend to suggest there had been a little bit of, in, little bit of invasion of some, of some technical nature, and a little while later, out comes a Chinese jet. Might just be coincidence, just say it, but it makes you think. Uh, target, target. Uh, if I say 146, what, why should the number 146 be significant in cyber security terms? That's a fairly wide question, isn't it? It's actually the global average of days, not hours, not minutes, not seconds, of days that an attacker is on somebody's system before they are actually discovered. And they were on target, big chain of stores in the States, siphoning off people's credit card details for about 18 months, if not longer, before they were actually, uh, uh, actually discovered. Car phone warehouse, mention that again. These are all different sorts of situations which are not necessarily just data related. This is about the operational activity of life on this planet. Uh, our power stations, our hospitals, our trading, our military. So we keep talking about data protection, but what is it about? 
It's about people. It's about looking after people. Decisions have to be made in terms of risk. So I know plenty of people who will say, oh yeah, I don't do online banking. Argos. Anybody shop at Argos? Yeah, yeah, I shop at Argos. Talking to somebody in the line the other day, he wanted to know, you know where he had to go, because he, he, he'd reserved it online, but he didn't want to pay online, because that's too much of a risk. But I explained it actually, that's all part of the process. That Okay, you pay with your credit card online. If your credit card details are compromised, part of the process is being able to contact your credit card company, who will obviously do a little bit of verification, and return the money to you. So actually, it's set up for a little bit of recovery and a little bit of resilience, noticing that some of these situations will take place. And it's not just about the data, it's about the people. So there are all laws of PowerPoint, laws of PowerPoint. At some stage, I've got to have at least a quote from Sun Tzu, or a pyramid, pyramid diagram, or an iceberg analogy. So at least I'll get over the iceberg analogy bit. Okay, so some of the stuff comes into that category, yes? People are out to get you or the organisation. If I want to attack the University of Manchester, I don't go straight and look, try to get in straight into the, in, into the main servers, the main experiments, or whatever it is they might be doing, all that valuable uh, data, all that valuable intellectual property. I'd start to look at what you do as individuals, and find out Facebook pages, and LinkedIn, and I'd go through you. So, actually, most people are just pawns in this. But there's an awful lot which is going on out there, which we, we sort of refer to as the low-level threats in terms of the great damage. It's not going to bring down nations, it's not going to fire nuclear missiles, but it is going to cause a reasonable amount of, uh, amount of misery. So just on, on that scale, I gave you some cards. Who's got a yellow card? And hands up all of those got a yellow card. I am terribly sorry. No, I'm only kidding, actually. There's no significance whatsoever to the colours. Just quickly write down, very, very briefly, if you have actually suffered a cyber security incident or attack or a happening, what it was, very briefly, what it, what it was and how it happened and how you felt. Very quickly, just jot it down, pass it down to the front. Oh, and yeah, if you could put your credit card details and your bank account uh, sort code on the other side of the card as well. No, that was a joke, really. <laughs> you would not believe the number of people who would do that sort of thing. We have a question if it's just the yellow cards or all the cards. All the cards, yes. Yeah, yeah, good, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Doesn't matter which card, yes. I just ordered the pastel ones because I thought they were quite nice. <laughs> Here's a couple. Do hand them down because I mean, I'm just kind of interested. And if I'm back to do one of these sessions, perhaps we can discover them in the future. But somebody found something in their eBay wish list which they hadn't put there. Hmm. So, did you take any action? Did you change your password? Yeah, I did. I changed it. I looked through my accounts, which my PayPal. There was just no signs of anything, and I kept some accurate pages. One strange thing happened that I was recently in the post. I don't really know where it came from. It was a bit of a slip of paper, some old eBay ID on it, so I thought something was going on. I've no idea what. I mean, some of these things just could be because a lot of the software is rubbish mm -hmm. uh, and mistakes happen. It's very complex, but it could well have been part of a bigger plot. I mean, my, compa my, my confession is that actually I started getting letters from banks saying, uh, we've, we're not giving you an account because uh, you know, your, your, your personal details are wrong. I thought, hang on, I haven't applied. Uh, we're cancelling your credit card. Fantastic. We're cancelling your credit card. Uh, and I thought, but I haven't got a credit card with you. Um, and all kinds of stuff were going on. All of a sudden, I, I get a letter from BT saying, sorry, we couldn't give you your customer number when you were on the phone. Because if you, if you have somebody's customer number, you can actually start to put, say, for example, it's somebody else's mobile phone number on your account. So that's actually quite a valuable bit of information. All of these things were, were going on. Um, but firstly, the police would actually would, wouldn't take any action on the basis that I hadn't suffered. Remember, we talk about this about people. I hadn't suffered because I hadn't lost any money. It was the banks who were suffering, apparently. Mm. 
I'd like to see you know, how, you know, how much money they've got compared to how much money I've got. It takes time. It takes worry. They did get involved when one of the neighbours, and this is why it's interesting of what was turning up, where one of the neighbours actually caught or saw somebody with their hands in the letterbox. And they have found that actually, well, I've done it myself, actually. You know, you walk down the street and there's a completely strange postman. And I say, you know, have you got something for number 15? Uh, you know, how genuine for us. So that's fine. Uh, and post people don't actually do any validation. They say, oh, yeah, 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 sure. You know, and, and, uh, and hand it over. And of course, that's what people do. So they may well, they might well have got into your post box. But they, that actually, the idea was, was that it was to be intercepted. And... Of course, if people are doing millions and thousands of these transactions, they only need so many to go through. So if somebody else received advertising texts every day, yeah. And of course, some of these things that we might be worried about, actually, we have given our consent for. We have given our consent for. Uh, I think somebody reckoned that you some, that to be really sure that what you have agreed, to, you know, together with your Facebook and your Instagram and all of the various other companies that you have dealt with and just, you know, clicked, okay, I accept the terms and conditions, you will probably have had to have read through anything up to 20,000 pages of legal agreement because everything for, for all the other stuff. Um, so, yeah, you know, you know, these are real and you know, clear and present dangers which may just cause a little bit of... Uh, inconvenience overall, but it really is something that you need to be aware of in the same way that you need to look, you know, when you cross the road, you need to be savvy, you need to keep an eye on what's actually going on. Because when it comes down to it, this is from an organisation called the National Cyber Security Centre. Anybody heard of the National Cyber Security Centre? Great, great, maybe get the price. <laughs> um, but uh, actually, they're not going to help you anyway, because you, you're probably, like the rest of us, uh, unless you're going to tell us something really interesting, uh, that uh, you're probably also classified on, around that bottom line. Basically, what this says, you know, if you're British Airways, or a power station, or a bank, uh, and you are, suffer some sort of attack online, the cavalry is going to come and help you. The National Cyber Security Centre, which is part of GCHQ, will come and help you. Most people, when our eBay is fiddled with, uh, when our Facebook uh, receives strange messages, uh, even when we actually find that you know, people have been you know, stealing and reusing our credentials to open bank accounts for themselves, what can we expect as normal citizens? We get an automated letter from our local police force. Sad? But perhaps that's the reality. But at the same time, we're supposed to lock our doors you know, and chain our bikes and all of these things. So we are supposed to make at least some basic, um, basic measures. And one of the challenges as to how much help we can get is how many people there are who are out there, and you may want to become some of these people themselves, who are actually going to tackle the cyber security problem as a challenge. Now, the challenge in itself is that most people, if you say cybersecurity, how many times, uh, and a cybersecurity expert, did you expect me to walk in with a hoodie and for all my anima all these slides to contain animations of green ones and noughts and things dropping down? Who expected who expected a cybersecurity expert in a hoodie? No? No? I've got the black hat, yeah? Yeah? But there you go. You know what they say, if you can't fight, wear a big hat. So, yeah, but in, compared to the amount of activity, they reckon, or it is reckoned by many organisations and governments, that there are anywhere between 1.8 to 3 million gaps, missing places, jobs for people in cyber security to counteract the cyber security threat. And I think that is wrong. I think we have hundreds of thousands, probably millions of sleeping beauties just waiting to be awakened. Sure enough, there is a case for some people to do clever software stuff. Much of it is actually for people who are in software development 
to recognize where all the flaws are and to actually build software correctly in the first place. And maybe if they had some of the problems that we have today, we wouldn't have to face. But if you look at the National Institute for Science and Technology, uh, NIST for short, in the States, uh, their website might not be on strike at the moment, I don't know, you'll have to have a look, NIST.gov uh, will be coming back. They've actually identified that there are 52 different roles in keeping cyber security. So it's all very well and good knowing how to fix a really deep down technical problem on your computer. But if you've got that computer in an organization, uh, in several organizations, in a supply chain, uh, across all kinds of linked different systems, then the management and governance skills required to actually get the right people in the right place, that's a cybersecurity skill in itself and an understanding. So it's not just a case of who can actually load up the right program. It's actually understanding you know, what the risk is. Is this a real risk to our organization? What's the fallout? Is this just between ourselves, within our organization? Is it within our partners? Um, is it going to attack, uh, affect our staff at home? All of these different questions have to be asked. And like I say, there are hundreds of thousands and millions of sleeping beauties who really suddenly awaken to the kind of skills that they've actually, uh, they've actually got. So m I think a lot of this misunderstanding is because of this film. Anybody seen this film? Few might not have done, but I'm going to lay the door at your parents. <laughs> and in some cases, possibly grandparents. I'm getting old. Right. 1982, this film came out. And it was all about the, those two kids who suddenly found that they thought they were playing global thermonuclear war as a game. And actually, what had happened was they connected with the real American thermonuclear um, war defense system. So as a result of this film, yeah, the hoodies and the cyber security has been seen by very many parents as something as a bit as a bit disrespectful, as a bit of something that people shouldn't get involved with. So people uh, might have been told that yeah, you're really clever with all you can do on a computer, but children on the whole have been discouraged with what otherwise be, been really useful and really good and legitimate expect, uh, experimentation. How do programs fit together? How do they break? What happens if? And the like. So an awful lot has been left because of, uh, left untried, left unencouraged. Now what I want to do is help you to understand uh, very, very briefly how it is that the bad people out there I'm giving you a clean slate here, even you know those people who downloaded the films, I'm, you know, we're wiping the slate clean here. And the bad people out there approach and do stuff. So I'm essentially going to give you a little bit of the anatomy of a cyber attack. But just in case, just in case you are tempted to try and play with things in the wrong area, make sure that when you go to cyber playgrounds, and we can talk about that off, uh, off literally offline, I suppose, um, and look into where you can learn some more of these skills. I will make these, uh, these slides uh, available, so don't feel you need to kind of photograph or, 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 write them, or write all of these things down. I just thought I would remind you that just because you're doing stuff online doesn't necessarily mean that uh, it's free and open to, open to do. So, for example, if you have discovered the web search engine Shodan, S-H-O-D-A-N, which actually shows you how many power stations and cameras and inter what, they, what is generally referred to as the Internet of Things, which is a daft thing, because your computers and your tablets and your phones are things which are connected to the Internet. But Shodan might show you what actually is on the Internet and what is and isn't protected. Actually, it shows you what isn't. It doesn't give you a right to then go on and start manipulating and playing with it. And some of it is directly through the Computer Misuse Act 1990, um, because just a, I think a few years prior to that, a chap, I forgot was the two people was involved, but one was called Robert Schifrin. Um, uh, Duke of Edinburgh is always in the news, but Robert Schifrin and his pal thought it was, would be fun to hack 
the Duke of Edinburgh's uh, email. It was an early email system called Prestel. Anybody ever heard of Prestel? No, don't, don't blame me. You know, you know. But essentially, they found you know weak password, you know traditional stuff. Oh, I said the P word. Does that said the P word? Does that? Yeah, and they're doing doing quite well. And they arrested him, and suddenly realised they didn't have anything actually to charge him with because there wasn't. Uh, any laws which stopped, you know, and said that people shouldn't read other people's emails. If he you know, opened his letterbox and stolen and opened his mail, another matter. But something online they haven't counted for. And if you think that those laws are just there in the background, please be assured, reassured, worried, I don't know which is the right word to, to use, that there is a terrific amount of international collaboration. So when you think Oh, actually, if I'm in China and I'm hacking, I'm safe. Actually, there's plenty of examples of the Chinese working together with the United States Secret Service to bring some of these criminals to, to mind. So there are international um, um, collaborations and cooperations already in place, which are already be, uh, being effective. Perhaps not as effective as we would like to be, but it's not perhaps such a wild west as some of us might, uh, might be worried. So, before we go into the really technical details, let's understand what the problem is on the internet. You've got something you might want to do, okay? You've got some objectives to meet. It might be in your learning, uh, it might be your research, it might be your job. It will vary from individuals to organisations. But to be able to do that, you will have assets. You will have your phones, you will have your tablets, you will have your computers. You will have the data on them, some of which will belong to you, some of which will perhaps belong to other people. And you might share stuff. But you've got these information assets, stuff that you need to do for your learning or your job. So something is quite important, probably, to somebody. But of course, there are some people who might like to cause you harm, they might be interested in what you're doing, they may offer a threat. But the question is, is can I be bothered? Are you really interesting? So we can start breaking down the big cyber security problem into smaller components. Because once we understand smaller components, that gives us the opportunity to think, is this really a risk that we need to be worried about? And if it is, what can we do to make things a bit safer? So they may be really motivated to attack you, you know, to fiddle about with your eBay or, or, or whatever. But maybe you were just you just happened to have a convenient post box. That was the asset that they were interested in. It might be for whom you are working, for example. So for example, I don't know how many of you, you might have some big industrial sponsor of a really big innovative organization with some really juicy intellectual property. I'm not going to attack them, I'm going to attack these people who've been saying, I've been sponsored by Company X. Am that right? So, you know, the, the trail starts to lead. So, of course, have they, have they got the motivation to attack you? Have they actually got the capability? Now, is there any vulnerability which people can take advantage of? The interesting thing, of course, that's going on a lot of the time now is people, and you might have received, I don't I haven't looked through all the cards, has anybody received one of these messages? saying, we've seen you looking at pornography on your webcam and doing naughty things, and I'm not going into any details here, thank you very much. Uh, we've seen you on your webcam, send us this money, uh, or we're going to distribute it all to, all, all to all your friends. Anybody had any of these messages? Yeah, 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 yeah. People get these messages, and despite the fact that they haven't done anything naughty, they haven't been looking at pornography, and they haven't certainly, you know, and, and all the rest of it, well, let's not go, let's not go there. People immediately get scared and feel that they need to pay the ransom. <laughs> now, it, it's a really fascinating, worrying, um, but, it, but an interesting opportunity from a psychology point of view. Now, here's me going, I mean, throwing lots of technical stuff in here. Um, the, we've got, at the University of Manchester, we have a digital futures program covering all kinds of different areas. One of the key areas is, as you might think, digital trust and security. The head, the professor who heads that, she is a professor of psychology, and that's brilliant, because it's the psychology and the understanding of how all of this stuff is structured and what goes on that actually gets us to understand how we should then go about the technology. 
Whereas, of course, you know, Apple and Microsoft and all these other organizations with great respect uh, are there to you know, fulfill a need. And we're a bit like, you know, when it comes to technology, we're a bit like the Americans who apparently need a new flavor of breakfast cereal every three months, otherwise they get bored. But hey, it's a strange, it's a strange world. So is there something that can be exploited? And you know, what would be the consequence? Okay, so you know, so I've, I've lost that file, it got corrupted, doesn't matter, I've got it backed up somewhere. On a memory, a memory stick, it's in the cloud and, uh, and, and the like. What is actually going to be the impact? Power station in the Ukraine goes off at Christmas time, big impact, bad news. So, you know, uh, so, you know, my, my eBay order doesn't turn up, I can get the money to back from my credit card company, yeah, not you know, there's a not so not so damaging, perhaps a little bit inconvenient. We have to put things into context. So if we understand this, we can do stuff to break down the opportunities for people to do these bad things, to get in, to, to degrade. You know, some organizations will have entire shadow mirrored systems of rubbish. But this, or the, or the invaders, the attackers, don't know it's rubbish. And so they will be distracted, and so they will be deceived into attacking the wrong part, which is another story. So I'm going to get you to join the intelligence services now, because this is what goes on with attackers. Firstly, they'll do some reconnaissance. They'll look at your Facebook. They'll look at your LinkedIn. They'll find out what really, really makes it interesting for you. And as a result of which, they'll see that, you know, you you like cats, you know, whatever it might be, or motorbikes, or cooking and the like. So you'll get an interesting email. Particularly if you've been in a fairly open discussion somewhere like Twitter or whatever, talking about this fantastic new restaurant. So all of a sudden in your, in your email, uh, or your uh, Facebook comms, you'll get a voucher. Of course you click on a voucher, and that voucher has got a little bit of software involved. You know, like the old, you know, they call them Trojans. And they call them you know, like the Trojan horse of Greek, uh, of Greek mythology or Greek history. I'm not going to go on with whether, it's re whether it was real. It's a good analogy of you know, welcoming something of vampires. Who watches Twilight? Yes. Yeah, you like Twilight? I can't stand a vampire story where the vampires are all under 25. It doesn't look <laughs> reminiscent. A little bit old and grey, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so no, 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 never quite got into it. Or it could be just the, they've got more hair and better looking than me, so like, it's probably just personal je jealousy. So they find out a little bit about you, the way to get in. And it's not just of you as individuals, but companies, a number of organizations, a National Computing Center, sorry, not National Computing Center, NTC Group, uh, who are now down, I think, in spinning fields, um, did a little experiment. And they sent um, little boxes with posh memory, uh, posh looking memory sticks to some of the top companies in the, in the country. And despite the fact, of course, all of these big top execs had been uh, coached and told never stick in a strange memory stick into your machine, this nice thing turns out, oh, it's for me. And what did they do? They load it up because they knew something about them. And as a result of which, they start to be able to exploit what's going on on their systems. Uh, Sony, the Sony organization, this is the sort of stuff that went on with the Sony organization a few years ago. Now, one of the things that the Sony organization did not do was to divide up their organization into different parts. Uh, so you might expect there'd be the films part, there'd be the administrative part, there'd be the IT part. So it was all joined together. They got themselves onto the network, probably through one of these phishing e emails, and the first thing they did was have a look at the IT department and get all the maps of the network so they knew where everything was. Uh, it's what you might call, there's a wonderful word called chutzpah. It's a Yiddish word. It, it's a level of cheek where you kill both parents and then ask the judge for clemency because you're an orphan. So there is no end to the cheek and the advantage that these criminals will take. To, get, to use you to get through to your organization, family, friends. I don't know anything about you. I haven't looked it up. But it could well be that you know, some of your parents, cousins, maybe yourselves, startups, goodness knows what, now are connected to major industrial goings on. Now, your, you might have parents in the military, in industry, and the like. Now, do not think 
that people will not use you as children to get to other things. And once they're on your systems, they will find ways to stay there. So it may well be that everybody's running around and really panicking to clean up machines or stop the spread of a piece of ransomware which is going to lock up everybody's data. But actually, what they're really doing is getting on some software so they can do some long-term monitoring and drain off the intellectual property. So again, we might use deception methods to kid them. They will do so. And they will out there will have their command and control computers to organize themselves. And in a way, some of these criminal networks have better IT departments, have better levels of expertise, have better organization than some of the people that we would expect to defend against us. Because they've got the real objectives. They, they've got the real motivation. They only have to be lucky once, whereas we have to be lucky every minute, every second of the day with every machine that we set up on our networks. So we have to understand this kill chain, as Lockheed Martin called it. Not necessarily that it will be carried out in that order, but we have to understand the components so that we can look to reduce the actual damage done by them. And you know, reconnaissance, that's difficult to stop that leakage. You might think, oh, well, I, don't, I didn't do it. I mean, you ask you how many social media sites can you, can you name? Well, how many of those would you have got? You know, you would have got you know, those are the Snapchat, the Facebook, and the, the, the obvious ones. But just about every organization has its own, just about every product has a related one as well, and everybody's getting you to sign up, and so many people are probably signing up and adding passwords which they've used, so any one of those actually gets infiltrated. They could well have the password to a whole lot of other information assets which are far more valuable. Sometimes the reconnaissance might be a little bit, bit more, even scarier. A um, little time back, uh, an American uh, a, a test missile went astray, and someone said that looks as if it's being controlled from elsewhere. Not proven, but it's plausible. Parliament, both Scottish and UK Parliament, was attacked a few years ago. Didn't seem to be doing any damage. But the question is, is were these attacks just testing the ground to see what happens? You know, it's, it's like, no, don't try this at home, like, you know, go, going in somewhere and setting a fire alarm going. So you can see, you know, how long does it take people to get out of the building? How long are they out of the building? Right, if I know they're going to be out of the building with their marshals for half an hour, now I know when that fire alarm is set off, I've got half an hour to get in and steal whatever it is I need to do. Yeah? Cybersecurity is often just the electronic equivalent of, of these issues. So what are people actually doing for? And actually, we're not going to have less. We're going to have more, but the good thing is, or the chance for uh, doing things better, is that each of you, and the people you talk to, and the people you develop tools and educational programs for, you've got the opportunity to have the message as pervasive as all the other things that you're there to actually teach them. And not to think that you're developing products for one particular system, developing a course or whatever it might be, and that it's not an SEP. Anybody know what SEP stands for? The SEP field theory as devised by the late Douglas Adams. Yeah? SEP is somebody else's problem. Yeah? It is not somebody else's problem. It is our problem. It is your individual problem. Because what happens, and it's a great example, when the ransomware hit the NHS a couple of years ago, everybody just started saying, oh, well, if you look at that, it's the Chinese. You just have to look at the English. That's, you know, that's been translated from Chinese. And then you've got people like um, my colleague who's a linguist, who actually sort of says, well, that, oh, where is it? Oh, yeah, that, actually, no. That's how a North Korean would write English if he wanted you to think it was somebody who was Chinese writing English. I hope you're keeping up. Uh, and you know, other people would blame the IT department because they hadn't patched the machines. But actually, who would ever thought of the fact that we're going to keep this system for longer than the operating system, the, the Windows, is going to be in existence? So actually, we never paid or asked the people who developed it to keep it going for as long as we want to use it. Which is often the case. I mean, I mean, how many people here buy a brand new car? How many people have second-hand cars? Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and you keep it going as long as, 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 as long as you can. And, you know, and as a result of which, you put up with certain risks and, uh, and, and, and the like. Uh, now, the interesting thing here is that people were jumping on and saying, oh, well, it was all the fault of the National Security Agency in America because they didn't tell anybody about this flaw. Well, okay, here's me standing, standing here flying the British flag. The National Cyber Security Center also make these decisions as to whether they should reveal the vulnerability in a particular system or whether they should hold on to knowledge of that vulnerability so that they can, whiz back, be able to exploit it themselves for intelligence purposes. And that's all fine and good if it's actually hitting uh, some of the bad people. So yeah, there are decisions to be made, risk actions to be make, to be asked. And you might actually say, well, maybe it was Microsoft and Apple's. What, the interesting thing is, is I think the people in this particular attack who got the least amount of publicity and blame and shouting at were the actual criminals who sent, actually sent out the, the ransomware, which actually stopped people having their medical appointments. People may, we still don't know yet, people may die because of this. People were on, for example, a, you know, a week's intensive program of chemotherapy which was stopped because they couldn't get the medical records to, find, to know for certainty which drugs they had and which quantities and what the next treatment needed to be. So there was too much risk. Risk decisions were made. As a result of which, people's treatments were interrupted and restarted. So we may never know, actually, the amount of death which took place. And it wasn't an attack on the NHS. Actually, it would just happen to be that the, the National Health Service, with its size and its complexity, just happened to be open in so many places to that kind of attack. But I'd say, you know, given all of those different views, given all of those different people, I'm going to put the plane closer to home. Because, you know, you've got your Macs and your PCs and your tablets and your phones. What is really important to you? What motivates you in terms of your technology? I will suggest it is three things. That's one of them, isn't it? That gets you w worried, doesn't it? <laughs> Rubbish Wi-Fi. <laughs> Can you just live with it? Find some other way around it? Yeah? <laughs> yeah? Third element? Yeah? What, what really worries you? Night out, you just need to call out Uber. And then you notice. Boom, boom. <laughs> so it's you, isn't it? You want it fast, and you want it cheap. And you want it resilient. Tell you what, I'll make a deal with you. Yeah? Two out of three ain't bad, you can have two. What, which do you want it? You want it fast? Yes. You want it resilient? Yeah. You want it cheap? Yeah. yeah. I told you, you can only have two. Alright, so we all demand this. And what do we do? We buy the stuff that comes out onto the market first, so we reward the fastest, not necessarily the most secure. Because they all know that like, they might just want to cause a little bit of havoc. But essentially, if there's money, people want the easiest route. And they don't care what might happen, the collateral damage, people missing their operations, people freezing to death because they can't actually get things. And there may well be bigger agendas uh, affecting the elections of one particular country, several countries, and the like. All kinds of stuff. Or it might just be revenge. An awful lot of it. And that's how a lot of people actually get onto the bad stuff. So anybody play these you know, on online games? Yeah, you, you know, there's a lot of, there was somebody, um, when I gave a similar lecture on Monday, and on their card, they, they left their computer logged on, and their best friend... Uh, was using their computer with their permission, but they found they were still logged on to their Pokemon, and apparently this, this best friend stole all their Pokemon characters. Uh, apparently they're still best friends, which just goes to show that you can get over, get over some things. But actually, that was the, uh, uh, quite just as illegal as the uh, people in the hoodies and the green screens and the like, under the Computer Misuse Act of 1990. They didn't have permission to be using that part of the system. So this was kind of bad stuff. And people start with these little things, and next thing you know, they're finding more and more opportunities. Which is one of the reasons, um, and Mandy had mentioned that I'm involved with 
this um, organisation where we train people who are on the autistic spectrum, who perhaps you might think that, uh, that you and I can sometimes worry or wonder, you know, is this okay to do, is it not okay to do? They have even more difficulties in discerning the wrong and the right. And unfortunately, the criminals know this as well, and they will groom them, and then they will entice them to use their really good analytical skills for all the bad stuff. So working with organisations like the police and their PREVENT programme, we're looking to actually make sure that we get these people in the early stages before they've done bad stuff or before they've done irretrievably bad stuff to encourage them uh, of how they can really use their skills for good. So 1.8, 3 million, however, we're looking at it. Like I say, there are all these sleeping beauties, and I count you amongst them, who are there to be awoken and their skills to be found. Because the old fogies like me, it's too late for most of us. Most organisations will, will call in a red team to try and hack them, to see whether, how far into the organisation they can actually get. Uh, and the blue team, the organisational team, will try and protect it. Now, the Institute of Information Security Professionals, of which I'm a fellow, we organise Top Gun events of red team versus blue team to give people exercises. And we have noticed that the red team go into their room and the first thing they do is, have a go, let's see what we can find out. Bit of reconnaissance, bit of weaponization, and they're well down the kill chain. Meanwhile, what do you think the blue team do? Worse than wait. Worse than wait, good, good suggestion. Any other suggestions what the blue team does when in their room? Almost. <laughs> well, even worse than that, at least they'd be doing something positive if they were getting a blue. The, the, blue, the blue team go into their room and they start making committees and deciding who's going to be the chief exec and who's going to head MIT. You know, and the red team's going, hey, this is great. Yeah, the psychology. Yeah. Never mind the technology, think about the psychology first. It's not really somebody else's problem. Wherever we are, if we use a device, we're part of the system. When I do all of those BBC interviews, nine times out of ten, some wily DJ who's running the programme will say, well, I suppose the thing to do is, is just to switch off and not use the internet. OK, well, I could switch off and not use the internet, but what about my banks? You know, what about Argos? What about all of these other organisations that I've dealt with and, and, and worked with and bought services from, not necessarily online, that hold my data. So actually, there's an enormous community with a lot of responsibilities. And they will use me and they will use you to get to the bigger fish. And don't just think that because somebody else has got a better computer, more data is doing a more exp interesting experiment, that, that you're going to be safe. Because actually, it could be the fact that, that they're doing something more interesting, that they will be therefore taking a little bit more care, therefore to get to them, they will go through you. Because each of your devices is extremely valuable. It might just be a word processor, or a games machine to you, or a development machine. But to the criminals, it's all of those. So think about what actual asset that you have got that you haven't actually considered. Because you will be the way through. And what we see with many attacks is that people make a big splash about it. And some people will say, OK, right, well, if we encrypt on our device and we have the passwords and the encryption keys and all of that kind of stuff, and people won't, can't, can't get them. And all of a sudden you'll look at YouTube and someone will say, ah, oh, yeah, but if somebody comes along and they steal, steal your computer just after you've switched it off and they spray some liquid nitrogen on the chips, it'll freeze it long enough to take the chips out, put it into another computer, and, and well, yeah, yeah, of course you can do that. But on the whole, on the whole, it's quite difficult to do. However, you've got organisations like Pentest Partners, and they've got some great videos, people like Joe Dalton uh, and Ken Munro. Just see what they can do. They put ransomware on people's, uh, obviously with permission for experimental, on, on, onto thermostats. So remember what the temperature got, got up to in, in, in Manchester into the 30s last year? Yeah? So, you know, what happened? What happened? You're sitting in your house. And you know, it was just great. I can set, I, you know, I can set the, you know, during the winter, it means that the house is going to be warm because I can set my thermostat from my phone. Somebody else gets control of your thermostat and sets it to the top temperature in the middle of the summer. Not so nice. Stops it working at all in the middle of the winter. 
not so nice. These are the real threats. Because people are building this stuff now, thinking, wouldn't it be great if we put a chip on it and connect it to the internet? But in the same way that all of this internet stuff actually originated uh, for distributing information about uh, particle physics and the like, which of course our great colleague um, Brian Fro uh, Cox is very, very interested in, as we all should be, on the whole, most people are not going to suffer as a result of not being able to get to that data for some time, or that data might, isn't going to be necessarily misused and the like. So there, are, there isn't that route of money to follow through. But we're using the same equipment, the same technologies. We are using it. That person is using it. And people keep saying this stupid thing. It's a stupid thing that they say. So actually, I think that most IT departments are stupid. Because if you ask IT departments, and I've done this, you know, what is the problem? And they will say stupid users. Well, that's like going to a library and complain, you know, the librarians complaining that people keep wanting to come and use the books. Yeah? If the IT department has got it right, and it's not, nobody has, has really achieved this yet, when the IT departments have it right, then any link that you get in your email, if it even gets through in your email, or on a website, should be safe for you to click on. The environment should be as such that it won't download some malware. It won't lock up your machine or whatever it does. You ought to be in symbiosis with the system. You should be viewed as part of the system. If you look at the international I'm sure you all read international standards thoroughly, but there is an international standard for IT governance, and it talks about computer architectures and big supply chains of, uh, of acquisition, but it recognizes pervasive through the entire creation and deployment and use and decommissioning, remember the decommissioning of information systems, that human behavior is there, all the way through from the, hey, wouldn't this be a great idea if we actually did this? Because what do we ask people to do? We ask people to work. And to keep, you know, and, and, but we're telling people to, well, yeah, do click on that, but don't click on that. And we're giving you loads of work and putting you under loads of pressure all at the same time. So it's really, really difficult for any individual to know kind of what their expectations are. So here I am preaching and saying, actually, really embed people as part of the system that you're designing. This isn't new. 1960, that paper was published. That, is it, I was even, that, now that's really old because that's before I was born as well. So this isn't a new idea, but we're still coming out and realizing, actually, we're putting the blames in the wrong parts of the, parts of the organization, parts of the community, parts um, you know, part of, the, uh, of our supply chain. And what we should be looking at is what our, our appetite for risk. Yeah, we can't decide that we're not going to go online because we want to achieve certain things. So as soon as we decide what we're doing online, there are risks to be mitigated. And depending on how you look and what you look at and how much expertise you've got, some of these can be deeply, deeply technical things. But remember that? Remember the iceberg? Looked at about three or four hours ago? Yeah? <laughs> Actually, so many of the problems, so many of the problems can be mitigated by just a few actions. Firstly, the most difficult one is getting people to do good stuff. Yeah? The most difficult part of getting people to cross the road is actually just remembering safely, is just remembering to look, you know, find a safe place to cross and the like. People are busy and they want to get across and they see that shop and the and the lot. So what are people's attitudes? You know, there's, there's an art to this stuff. This isn't just a technical manual of what to actually do. So anything which is to do with cyber, and when I say cyber, I mean this connected flow of information and people working together with that connected flow of information and doing stuff, whether it's calculating somebody's pension or dropping the, uh, the cooling uh, rods into a, into, a nuclear, into a nuclear reactor. Okay, these you know, control. Cyber, the word cyber comes from steering. Any Greeks? Anybody from Greece? It's a Greek word. Right. Well, this is where it comes from. It doesn't come from a science fiction novel upon which I think The Matrix came out of back to movies again, uh, called Neuromancer, which everybody quotes from 1984, I think it was published. It comes from 1948 and a professor in the United States. But people didn't like the word cyber. So you know what they've replaced it with? 
artificial intelligence and machine learning. And it's drifted off. So what are we doing? We're creating artificial intelligence and machine learning and actually thinking, well, what are the, you know, what are the security implications? And security is not a matter of just don't do it and lock things up, which is what the IT departments tend to say. It's, well, actually, how can we achieve things safely and effectively? So it's not just about confidentiality and locking everything up. It's about also the integrity of this right, and importantly, the availability. If I said the names Holly and Jessica to you, does that ring any bells? Why not? But it's it possibly one of the most tragic cases. And it caused a whole change in people's attitude to this thing that we call data protection, where one police force decided actually it would be bad data protection um, um, activity to tell another police force about their concerns about a particular person. This person went on to get a job in a school in a different police force's jurisdiction, and this guy murdered two little girls. Mm -hmm. Cybersecurity is not just the bits and bytes and circuit boards of those devices in front of you. It's the legal framework around it. It's the political framework around it. It's the environment. I think Iceland reckoned that uh, actually the, they are now using more in energy to try and uh, generate the um, cryptocurrency of Bitcoin or like the other cryptocurrencies than actually they are making money on the actual cryptocurrencies. So all of these different factors about what you're putting together. And it's a question not of the data protection, but of the safety of the people. I was teaching a group from the Western Balkans. I, I love them for many reasons, but possibly the whole reason. I was trying to draw an analogy between safety and security. Anybody from the Balkans? Good, because I've got this wrong. You see. No, but, uh, I was trying to draw an analogy between safety and security. Uh, and so I said, sorry, but can I just stop you? I said, yeah, sure. What's the issue? It's the same word in their language. They don't have different words for safety and security. I think that's where we have still got to develop. We've still got to mature so that actually what we're doing is looking at resilience. Protection is important, but how do we cope and actually bring things back? Because actually, you know, everybody is a threat. You know, you're connect you might be emailing me, I may be connecting with you, I may be looking at your websites, using your tools and the like. The opportunities to do bad stuff uh, for people to do that stuff and take advantage of what, of, of what we do are legion. So we need to be that little bit connected. So it's not just about, well, it's probably not going to happen to me. Actually, it's a case of what can I actually do as part of the system? Have I achieved that level of symbiosis? So we can look at all of this really exciting you know, cyber centurion Activity across the world, all of these countries setting up their cyber security armies to, you know, to, to not to be defensive, but to be offensive as well. But I'm not really that interested, to be part of this, because I think the, the foot soldiers are you, you know, with the right attitude. You are going to create, potentially, that fifth column. Wherever you are, and whatever you do, and whoever you talk to, those actions you take online and the systems that you create. So I want you to think about five simple things in the same way that we all should be eating our five a day fruit and veg. We should be looking at our five essentials that we should think about online. So, yeah, kind of, who's interested in firewalls? Who knows what a firewall is? I probably couldn't really explain it properly anyway, but I'm not interested because I buy a device and I can put one on. And it basically means that it'll keep out an awful lot of bad stuff, which is great. Who's got a, who's got a garden? Who's, who lives in a house with a garden yet? Yeah, one or two people? You've got a garden wall? Can people climb over it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, of course they can climb over it. But at least you only have to worry about the cheeky buggers who actually climb over it. Most people will walk around. Right? Uh, the security measures are, are, are boundaries for either honest people or people who can't be bothered. So they haven't got that enough motivation. So you can start to focus on, on an awful lot. You buy stuff. You buy stuff. Just think about, you know, you, you buy stuff, you load it up, it comes with a default password. Uh, and, well, just think about it. Well, so does the person who wants to you reuse uh, or abuse your whatever it is that you're using. 
They've also got the same default password. Change it. Get rid of it. Little things that you can do. Most people seem to be using Macs. I keep, must get a Mac so I understand how to work it. But those of you who use Windows machines, if I say there's a, a, a user account and there's an administrator account. Anybody know about that? Who knows about that? One or two of you. I always see, see, this is the problem. You become complacent. I've been talking to people about other passwords. People don't realize that there are two kinds of accounts. If you're an administrator, the world is the mollusk of your choice, and you can do just about anything on your machine if you know how to do it. And you can change things and set things up and connect left, right, and center, and install all kinds of programs. Fantastic. If you're a user, you've got a user account, then you're generally much more restricted. So, if you're busy doing your day-to-day -day surfing, answering your email, or whatever it is with an administrator account, and you're working hard, and you've got a deadline to meet, and you accidentally click or click without thinking too much on something, and you're using an administrator account, it's yummy, straight in, the software loads, you've had it. If you're using a user account, it might just slow things down, it segments, and it doesn't, and it basically will say, do you really want to install this? Gives you that extra step, extra bit of thought. Very, very, very powerful thinking as to what to load. Now, a lot of the people will say, well, actually, there's no point loading having antivirus software, because particularly because it only affects 30 percent. It only detects about 30, maybe 40 percent of uh, pieces of malware. But most of the malware that will attack normal people like you or me is going to be the commodity stuff, the automated stuff. And isn't it worthwhile at least dragging that up? It's not like the old days. Actually, our computers are pretty powerful these days. It's not like the old days where a lot of antivirus software would really slow things down. So that's a myth. That's gone. At least take basic protection, okay? And finally, 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 yes, software, because of its complex nature, and often only when it's loaded up and running, actually reveals what the problems with it are. So Microsoft and Apple and Oracle and even the, the, you know, the special, uh, specialist environments that you use to develop educational tools with, they will also find flaws, but they will send out the repairing patches, to use the technical term, the upgrades, to actually fix those. So, you know, no person is an island. You're not expected to fix those or even detect them. So you're sent, frequently, ways of making your machines that bit safer. Now, say thank you, and click things in. Because it might take an hour or whatever it is, if in a bad case, to, you know, to, to download and uh, uh, install it and then reboot your machine and get back to where you were. So you lose an hour. Is it better than that? Isn't that better than losing a lifetime's work on the computer? Or losing, uh, losing your entire access just before that deadline of that assignment has to get in? So there's an awful lot you can do with these five cyber essentials. Yeah, actually, you know, the five a day and the fruit and veg, like most things, it's a lie. Five isn't enough. It's actually seven, possibly nine. But they don't tell you five or they'll tell you seven or nine because people won't get started. Yeah? So it's better to get people at least started with the basics and as far further that you can go with this. But you know, this is the just generally looking. So 1.8 million. Three million, an awful, probably great skills gap. It's not about teenage boys in hoodies, which is what they always put the background on the news reports when something happens. Yeah, sure enough, there are occasions. Perhaps Talk Talk is one of the famous ones where actually one of their big data breaches was the result of the work of a 16-year-old boy. The really sad thing is that the, the problem had been known about for 17 years. So it was actually older than the person who, who, uh, who, created the, who created the exploit. But there are all kinds of different areas to, to, to get in. Uh, Emma, for example, her background was in material science. Victoria, classics, Latin, Greek, all of that, all of that kind of stuff. Jenny Radcliffe, uh, she is, she, her, she, her expertise is in social engineering. And so she will be the one who will look at the people's perimeters and actually show you this is where 
people would go to get through, and she works with technical teams uh, and the like. I think she says that bringing up the, her, her upbringing in Liverpool was perhaps some of the best training for that side of stuff. Karen, now that's where you start to get down to the, you know, the deep dive technical vulnerabilities. But these are all part of a wider community of day-to-day -day people who are involved with just thinking about how we make things safe online for the people that we are involved with. Though these, to a certain extent, are the cyber security specialists, where you should be the cyber security everyday people, just thinking about how you build things into your systems. Have we got time for a four minute video? Just put all of these things that I'll be telling you together, and this can be the result. But six months before the lights went out in the Ukraine, this is what was happening. The kill chain months before the light went out. People are still working. Talking to a manager in the NHS, he had 6,000 active accounts, and he only had 2,000 staff. And you make excuses. Oh, it's just taking a bit longer, it's probably uploading, downloading something, or maybe I'm tired, or whatever it is. Sometimes not suspicious enough. Social engineering. You're going to start the attack. Don't start in the middle of the day when everybody's active and fresh. You start just a little shift on tired. I don't want to mess around. Socially construct things. We have people who earn well minimum wage, seven was it, seven pounds eighty six an hour. And we tell them to work at terminals, and we ask them to <coughs> be the frontline protection of our multi billion pound organisational assets. Fair? Maybe not. Maybe it is. Maybe it's the only way that we have at the moment. when you have a number to phone a help desk to get through, so flood the help desk. It's a blended attack on all of these different fronts, making sure that the impact is the maximum. Another little child crying. And it went on for days. As we finish, I'd like you to bow your heads in prayer. Now, come on, let's go to school assemblies. Our metadata. Come on, you can all say, you can all read this out, think about it. Our metadata. The dart in clouds. <laughs> Cyber attack fodder be thy name. 
my nation state be backing, my organised crime be hacking, as Belarus as it is in Manchester, <laughs> and Sydney and Shanghai and Albuquerque, and the International Space Station, connectivity, Tim Peake, um, f phoned somebody from the International Space Station and it, it, it was the wrong number. Hi, is Tim Peake? Oh yeah, sure, Brrr. You can just imagine it, can't you? Forgive us this day our vulnerability patches, and forgive us hasty coding. I bet this is something you're all guilty of, as we accept app apps that access more than they should. The line is the Internet of Things, the wibbly wobbly web of virtual worlds. Have you ever considered that WWW takes a lot as an acronym takes longer to say than World Wide Web? I wonder where it is. Until the EMP. You know what an EMP is? The electromagnetic pulse. Yeah? Those things that come from great big explosions or possibly that big orange thing that we occasionally see in the sky through the gap in the clouds. So, yes. So, a few bits of background reading there, most of which, most of which actually, aren't te very technical in nature. It's looking about how things work, the psychology, the intelligence. Cybersecurity has commoditized intelligence. So as you use, as you design, as you work, as you advise, as you live your lives online, just be a little bit smarter, okay? Ask questions. Yeah. And when things turn up in your, e great, a great example, I should be using that all week. When things turn up in your eBay, think, was it really me? Or have I told them something that actually means that I need to be, or I, should, I will be receiving, should be buying that kind of product? And I hope you kind of realise that I'm really, really serious about this subject, um, but not necessarily about how I say it. <laughs> so I hope I've left you something to think about. Any questions? Okay, well, thank you for this. Yeah, yeah, we go, we go, we go, we go. Yes, oh. sorry. <laughs> I, I, I thought I was going to get away easily then. Yeah. Um, can I get some of your thoughts on uh, Linux systems? And are they worth people investing in if they, you know, are looking to work with secure systems? Uh, I'd say it doesn't matter whether it's uh, Linux or Linux or whatever. People probably spend more time arguing over how you pronounce it. It doesn't matter whether it's Linux uh, or it's Apple uh, or, it's, or, or it's Windows or any other kind of, or, or any other kind of operating system. Um, everything, everything has its flaws and its vulnerabilities. Anything that you take, you have a responsibility to organize the right people to make sure that it's going to be online and safe. I mean, I think what's, it's, it's interesting over the years that various people have said, you know, certain things are, you know, that certain things are 100% safe and they never are. Nothing, it, it, we need to find a new word, word other than security, which is why safety. I mean, I mean, it all comes down to, it all comes down to a degree of managed risk because if you can find the staff who've got the, uh, you know, the Linux stroke Linux experience, um, then, then yeah, then, then, then that's fine. But what you've got to look at before you even get down to the lines of code is having the structure in place to actually set it up securely, and maintain it securely. Uh, and I haven't mentioned things such as the MITRE organization's list of vulnerabilities, of, you know, a thousand and, the th thousand and nine vulnerabilities that people know about. Um, um, but there's probably <coughs> about 10 organized by the Open Web Application Security Project, OWASP. The people just keep repeating over and over again. You know, like was it said in the Bible, Ecclesiastes, nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. Um, so, yeah, so the, yeah, there is a technical side of stuff. Uh, but there's also the social side of stuff. So uh, it's really a case of deciding what is best for the application you're using. And I use application as in how it's going to be applied, not application app sort of thing. So, you know, the, 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 the wider picture. And recognizing what you've got, you know, what you've got long term, uh, what maintenance and, and, and support you're, you're, you're going to have. You know, this, that was the whole one of well, one of the issues with the, with the WannaCry issue is that systems were being used for very good reason, 
They couldn't upgrade whatever it was because then the medical systems wouldn't work. Uh, doctors and nurses don't care about the security and the technology. They just want to make people better. So that is their priority. That is their objectives. That's what people have to keep a view on. And it sounds daft, but I used to work for the National Computing Centre. And when I joined in 1989, what were you doing in 1989? Don't answer that. Um, 1989, when I joined in 1989, they just published this guide, which basically said, wouldn't it be great if the people who use computer systems talk to the people who design computer systems and the people who buy computer systems? Because quite often, they are three completely separate roles in organisations. And a few years later, people and people are still saying this, and people don't do enough talking. And people are still saying, stupid users, it's all their fault, they shouldn't click on stuff. Uh, yeah, and we're going to have to live with a lot of these issues. But I think we're now becoming a little bit more savvy in terms of what we can do to support each other, and to actually see this from a community point of view and actually realise that what is what one of the issues has certainly been is that we have not really thought about diversity in terms of thought. So it's been, you know, very cliched, but you know, you know, kind of you know, techie boys running in and doing, you know, some clever hackable stuff. Hacking from a good point of view uh, as, as well. And I I should know, um, you know, boys generally aren't very good at questioning things. So actually having the women's view and you know, actually saying, you know, is that a good idea? What about what about other ways of doing things? And that's just the male female side of stuff. There's all the you know the cross cultural ways of of viewing things as well. So you know, so so you know, if so if you know, I, you know, I, I think some of my, my 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 some of my best students are actually from Nigeria because there they are much more um, open to you know to questioning the teachers. Uh, other countries, I mean, it's all very nice to have super duper respect, but I'm a university lecturer because I want to discuss and I want to continue learning. And some people from some countries think that every time I open my mouth, it has to be written down and that's the way. They don't, they don't challenge me. And a lot of them, if I'm challenged, yeah, it's great. So, yeah, so, so, you know, all of the, you know, different, you know, different cultures, different religions, uh, you know, different sexes, everybody has got a different view, and it's only those coming together that we take, like, that makes so actually we probably don't need 1.8 million. Certainly don't need 3 million, don't want 1.8 million. We actually just need more collaboration and cooperation against the resources we've got. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, I, I think, Bukha, uh, my question. I, I want to ask uh, how you protect the kids' uh, uh, security, the si system security, such as the uh, online training system, the monks of the as an online training system, how to keep the security of them? Uh, going back, I remember earlier on I talked about this international, this is international standard. Uh, I don't know all the international standard numbers off by heart, but I am a bit boring because I do know some of them. This is ISO, International Standards Organization, stroke IEC, which stands for the International Electrotechnical Committee Standard 38500. 38500. And in there, it's a nice thin standard, unlike some standards which are great doorstops. Uh, this standard is nice and thin, and it basically breaks down uh, technology into six areas. The first of which, and, that's, and, and the first of which is, is the answer to your question. It's setting responsibilities. Who's got responsibilities for what? And it's a bit like those, those cyber essentials. So if, if you're designing a training system, there are those people who should be able to operate and change the way that the system works. There should be those people who just operate the system. There should be just those people who check, who, who can use the system. And in terms of its content, you might have people um, um, being taught particular skills or courses uh, for which uh, they are, there are certain prerequisites. So that needs to be structured accordingly. So all of the good decision making that you would make uh, in how you structure and allocate responsibility needs to be then created within the systems that you're developing. And the good um, development environments will allow you to do that. Um, and it's possible, uh, I imagine, that where that hasn't been thought of, there will then be the possibility to build applications 
uh, to connect with these who, that will manage some of these things, manage some of these things for you. But whatever it is you then put together and have designed is is equally important that it that, that it's tested, um, but also tested and evaluated in the early stages. So if you're looking at all of these different roles, um, you actually talk to them, and that goes back. Remember, I said there were these six elements. Uh, the top one was responsibility. The last one, which is pervasive, is, is, is human behaviour, because it's a case of well. If, it's, if the security that you build in is a little bit difficult to use, people will find ways to work, you know, to, to work around it. Um, well, the classic things with um, that attack on, on Parliament um, that I mentioned, um, it, um, people, certain um, members of Parliament, the MPs, their mailboxes were hacked. Uh, and people got into them and they were getting the MPs' data. Uh, and as a result of which, Certain MPs were coming out and saying, "Oh yes, but we share our, you know, we need, we have lots of email coming in, and we share our passwords and usernames with our staff." And everyone is going, "Oh, shock, shock, horror! Everybody's sharing usernames and passwords." I can't be bothered. I'm not interested. I, I, that doesn't surprise me. What bothers me is the fact that the governance of this, and you know, within, you know of this sector dial is being managed and handled over email. So, which is the latest version? You know, has it actually come from somebody purport, you know, is the, the, you know, the, the real person? Um, all of that organization and that information is being handled in people's mailboxes rather than designed into the system. Uh, and, that's the, and that's kind of where sort of security actually comes in, in that allocation of responsibilities, that segregation. So and you know and the, and the protection of the assets, particularly you know on a training system, uh, you know what you know. All the question is what you're training people to do, um, and what level of qualification will they achieve of, of actually having having gone having gone through that. So all the good principles of, of designing training and education uh, need to be reflected, uh, you know, within these systems. You need to think about how these systems actually enhance the user experience and don't just replicate what might otherwise have been done on a blackboard and a piece of paper. Does that help? Yeah. Hi. Hi. I have a question about AI technology. And we generally, uh, most of people's information uh, have been collected by uh, our legal hand. And uh, in this case, um, so uh, technologies can collect this data daily and to analyze it. So, what to what to extent do you think that the AI technology can be a kind of security measures? I th I think uh, AI or machine learning or, or whatever you, you title it, it it's a bit of it's a, it's it's a two pronged sword. I mean, as um, as um, Shakespeare wrote about cybersecurity, Shakespeare said that there are some things which are kind of pure cybersecurity type. Disciplines. So the people who are learning how to uh, or, or doing how to actually penetrate systems and work out where the flaws and the, vul and the vulnerabilities are. Then there are some systems from which we can actually learn from. Uh, so, for example, there are products now come on the market coming on the market, and they are um, designed to. Uh, Essentially, like mimic, uh, I suppose, what you call it, the, 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 an, an immune si an, an immune system, and those systems are, are using uh, you know, as our body adapts. There's the kind of activities that you might that you might call artificial intelligence if it was done by a computer, or it was actually done by us. Therefore, it's a it's a it's a natural it's a, it's a natural process. They will um, use those to actually adapt. And the third category, as Shakespeare might have said, is that some um, stuff has cybersecurity thrust upon them. Now, from that, from that, I mean, um, there will be systems where actually, yes, we have, you know, we have this really clever artificial intelligence system and, and we uh, machine learning, and we need to train it up with this particular data. But of course, people who want that then to give answers other than perhaps what we might hope for. 
we you know, may well want to train it with data that shouldn't be. And of course, obviously, we've got all of this issue now uh, with, 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 um, with elections. But it's very, so, so artificial intelligence might actually help us. And I think a lot of people are now researching and looking at this to be tools to improve cybersecurity on the, on the very basis that there's just so much going on. Even if we did have three million people, we couldn't have three million people looking at every transaction on every, on, on every system. The way that we sample it and then analyze it and the like, we're going to have to use these devices. It's, it's a bit like a kind of homeopathy. We're going to have to use the uh, we're going to have to use the poison to actually help treat our reaction to the poison. What is called? I've just been filmed calling artificial intelligence poison. I didn't. It was an analogy. Okay. Um, so there. So yeah. So so you so you so you've got so you've got this uh, artificial intelligence, whatever whatever label you're giving it, as a tool to cure and make things better because of the reaction and the learning process that it can. And you know you get the algorithms right, and it might it's down to what getting the algorithms right. But also there's the systems which will rely on it, which similarly need to be secured in exactly the same way that I want my laptop or whatever secured, so that when I'm doing my banking, somebody else isn't looking in, you know, over my electronic shoulder to you know to see what I'm, what it is that I'm doing. Yeah. So, but what's in the, this kind of technology? We can't control it. I mean, uh, I know. Uh, Film named uh, Iron Man. <laughs> there is here is an artificial uh, robot made by human, but uh, it's smarter than any human, and he can be a hacker to any system. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> um, but actually, yeah. Okay. But the, generally, most films uh, are, kind of, are, are are posited on on some fairly simple premise. Um, and this goes back. I mean, I mean, you're quoting me this one. I can quote the um, uh, Forbin Project, which is a, actually it's, it's a book. Uh, there's a series of three books. Forget called Colossus. Um, forget the, the other two books because they just get really silly, so like, really mad science fiction. But the first book is basically where uh, America uh, generates, you know, the ultimate artificial intelligence, which is going to make the ultimate moral decisions as to whether they'll launch the nuclear missiles. Um, and of course, they don't want anybody to interfere with it, so they totally cut it off from the world. Of course, the point being is that, they, is that it finds a way to overcome this. The Russians have created a very similar thing, and the two of them take over the world, sort of thing. So yeah, yeah, you know, wh whatever we can imagine, uh, yes, you, you, you can go there. Um, but I think what we're, 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 we're really good at imagining you know, kind of these dystopic visions. Um, you know, utopias are unrealistic, but um, I think it could be anything in life. Uh, in, in, uh, in life. You know, the same reason why we've got all of these cybersecurity challenges is because so much will have a dual use, uh, and we just need to be able to police either as individuals or our forces or our intelligence services, etc., etc., what these things are, are, are being used to, and there will always be there will always be this arms race. Um, but I don't, I don't, I don't see them taking over. I don't see them taking over. Uh, you know, uh, the, 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 there's always some sort of kind of kill switch which will turn up in in, in some way. So uh, yeah, it's a bit like the uh, there's great fear of grey goo uh, nanites being sort of taking over the world you know, a, a few years ago. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, um, can I just say we're, we're really hoping to work more closely with Bunny in embedding this kind of thing, these issues into the course more clearly. So we're going to have. Have a chance, hopefully, for you to send questions to Danny, um, and certainly we'll be around for the next five minutes here. If people, uh, well, no, actually, not today because I've got, a, I've got, a, I've got a, okay. uh, we've got a big project called the Cyber Foundry worth looking up and seeing what's going on. Uh, working with the University of Manchester, Manchester Metropolitan University, University of Lancaster, and Salford University are working together to up the game of small to medium sized businesses in cybersecurity, uh, and we're interviewing. So I've got, yeah, so I've got to calm down and get in the right way of serious interview mode. Okay, but if, it, if people have got extra questions, could they send them to us on weekend? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll have a forum around send, send them direct. Yeah. So send, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Danny.